Good morning. Uh, good morning and welcome to the opening event of the Mission Oriented Innovation Network's Global Gathering, which, following on from COP26 and its urgent mandate, is dedicated to the theme of mission oriented innovation to tackle the climate crisis through green missions. My name is Matthew Thompson and I work as a research fellow in Rethinking Public Value here at the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at UCL. Um, and the Mission Oriented Innovation Network, or MOIN as we call it, is housed at the Institute and brings together over 90 leading global public sector institutions, including cities, state investment banks, innovation agencies, design agencies and government sectoral units. And the network's aim is to share the challenges and opportunities they face when trying to create and nurture public value and also to explore how mission-oriented innovation policies can tackle the grand challenges that society faces. This week's series, and this is the first of, the, of, of these events, consists of five online events over the next three days, and we'll explore a range of topics from an analysis of COP26 and what this means for mission-oriented innovation, through to exploring and highlighting the highly critical roles of both finance and design in driving the transition. We'll hopefully crowd in insights from our IIP academics as well as global policymakers, designers and public sector actors who are implementing a mission-oriented innovation approach. So today we're really excited to be joined by Clara de la Torre from the European Commission and Alex Cook from Australia's National Science Agency who will be in conversation with our very own Professor Mariana Mazzicato to discuss their different approaches to mission-oriented innovation with, with respect to tackling the climate crisis. Let me paint a very quick picture about what missions are, right? So they, they, they have the potential to solve wicked problems and grand societal challenges, the kind of challenges that are really resistant to, to straightforward technological or market-based solutions. Um, missions can focus minds and resources on ambitious and inspiring measurable common goals, and they can galvanize action from multiple stakeholders that might otherwise not be forthcoming were it left up to markets alone. And I guess we can see this from COP26, right? The recent negotiations, is, if they can teach us anything, it's that mo moving towards a mission-oriented approach is now more urgent than ever. If we ever, if we're going to come close to to avoiding the worst impacts of climate breakdown. So, a big question for today's discussion, I guess, is about collaboration and coordination. How do we join up the different missions happening across different geographies? I'm hoping that we can tease out the connections and differences in the approaches taken at different scales as well. Right. So, at the supranational scale, um, between different nation states, we have. Clara de la Torre, speaking on the EU's missions. Clara is Deputy Director General at the European Commission's Directorate General for Climate Action and is Mission Manager for the Adaptation to Climate Change mission at the European Union. At the federal national scale, we have Alex Cook. Alex is the General Manager for, missions, for, for the Missions Programme within the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation, which I think is known as CSIRO, but correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> In Australia. And of course, we have Mariana Mazzicato, who is Professor in the Economics of Innovation and Public Value at University College London and the founding director of IIPP. Mariana has pioneered work on missions at various scales, right, from the local to the global. And I think it's fair to say that her work has had a big impact on various new mission oriented policy programs around the world, including the EU's and Australia's CSIRO. So, uh, for me, it's, it's going to be fascinating to hear from both Clara and, and Alex about their respective journeys through mission thinking and the lessons learned along the way. Right, so once I shut up, which will be in, in, in literally a minute, we're going to hear from each speaker in turn for a, around seven minutes, followed by a curated discussion uh, between them. And then I'll open the floor to a more open, so to a sort of a Q&A. So if you could please use the Q&A function to type in any questions that you might have that occur to you during the conversation, and I'll do my best to field them at the end to our speakers. Right, so first up is Mariana. So uh, the floor is yours, Mariana. Great, and I've just put on my timer so I don't go over seven minutes. We don't have timers, we talk way too long. So first of all, it's so wonderful to be here with uh, Clara and Alex because <clears throat> in the Institute really, you know, we try to be humble. We try to actually work with organizations and institutions for a long time. So it's not just about kind of preaching, you know, do this, we're so smart, don't do austerity, invest and use emissions approach. It's actually about the details. And we call this practice-based theorizing. So if we as economists and political economists, but also there's obviously many interdisciplinary approaches in the Institute have better ideas for how to do capitalism, really what we're about is practice-based theorizing. So in actually trying to implement some of these ideas, uh, which include the missions approach, we actually learned that it's much, 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 much more difficult than any sort of pamphlet, brochure, or you know, speech could pretend to be. 
So that learning that comes back to the theory itself, which then over time guides, hopefully, better policymaking is, is really important. And so uh, we were just reminiscing with Clara that we've been uh, working together indirectly and then directly uh, around missions since really since 2013, when I first came in and talked about the entrepreneurial state and the European Commission, and then later working very closely with the DG head in um, research and innovation, Carlos Modas. And on the back of that, this concept of missions finally saw its way to the actual instrument that we currently have in Europe. And of course, through also trips to Australia and other countries, we've been working with local policymakers, and it's been really, really interesting to see how it's been taken up in Australia. But I want to begin with this point that missions really should be a thorn in our side. <laughs> if anyone gets comfortable with missions and starts smiling too much, then we know we're not doing the right thing because it's really about change, changing the current way, the status quo of how we've currently designed policy. And the way, um, you know, and this is my usual spiel, but I don't tire of saying it because I'm not seeing change, the status quo of how policy continues to be for the most part designed globally is as a correction. It's not really an objective. So the state is seen through its different policy making processes as at best, you know, at worst, get the hell out of the way, at best is fixing market failures. You actually have to wait for the market to fail or worry it might fail or to have too little private investment and in things like research and development or too much investment and in bad things like pollution and the state will come in, fund basic research, or introduce a carbon tax, or fund SMEs, small medium enterprises due to information asymmetries, so on and so forth. So this is a very strong framework in economic theory that guides policymakers, and it's called fixing market failures. So the first thing about missions is this is about a complete reconception about what the state is for. It's not about fixing, because otherwise you're always too little too late, literally, <laughs> out of breath, whether it's on big tech or climate. It's about co-shaping and co-creating the economy and the market itself as an outcome of that process. Um, and in doing so, that's not necessarily good or bad, right? I mean, that's kind of what the state has done it, from the beginning of capitalism. It has actually been in many ways a transformative force. And if you're interested in that, read Karl Polanyi. But the normative question is, what is it that we're co-shaping and co-creating? Emissions becomes an explicit way to talk about that. And by the way, making it explicit also means opening it up to contestation. You know, who decides what these missions are? Is it just a top-down process like the Apollo program? Or what does it mean to have serious citizen engagement in the process, not through endless consultations that produces chaos, but it does mean also being quite innovative on the social innovation side, perhaps new fora, whether it's citizen assemblies, uh, in London, where we're implementing the missions approach, for example, we've brought resident associations to the table for the clean growth mission, which is nested within particular housing estates. This is um, part of the Camden Renewal Commission, so part of London called Camden. Um, and I just want to finish, I've got, I think, two and a half or three minutes left with just some of these issues that make it a provocative question, that it's not a cozy, oh, let's all cozy up to missions. You know, this is again about doing things differently in the big sense of market shaping, not market fixing, but also in the very specific sense of three things I, I want to just name and we might come back to them. First of all, the public-private partnership. No more subsidies, guarantees, handouts with no conditions attached, right? A new social contract has to be at the center of a mission-oriented approach. This is about public and private working together towards goals. So whether we have a public bank or a bailout program during COVID-19, what's the, what's the contract? What's the deal, right? So it was really interesting that when in Germany, on the back of their Energiewende challenge, I'm not sure if we'd call it a mission, but it's very close to a mission, the way that the public bank, the KFW, started to interact with sectors like the steel sector was not just giving money out because steel is in crisis, it was, hey, steel, you want some money? Guess what? The condition is lowering your material content of steel production, which the German steel sector did do. Many steel sectors haven't done that. And they did it not because they went to Davos and talked about purpose and stakeholder value. They did it because they had to in order to receive that public loan. So that's just an example. And in France, the, the Minister of Finance actually implemented some of this conditionality with the COVID-19 recovery which, uh, you know, with Air France and Renault, the conditions attached to those COVID recoveries was that those sectors had to commit to lowering their carbon 
uh, emissions. In the UK, we didn't do that. We gave 600 million to EasyJet, no conditions attached. Uh, second, um, capabilities. You know, we need better capabilities and capacity within our public administrations. Missions will never happen just through, you know, helicopter money from Europe going into member states if then those member states have not been investing within their civil service instead of just kind of to consulting companies like McKinsey outsourcing that capacity. We need stronger public administrations that can get really creative through the use of things like conditionality, but also procurement policy. We would have never gone to the moon without NASA redesigning the procurement policy to be in an outcomes oriented way. I've just written a whole book about that called Mission Economy. So, and also we have a very good report with UNDP reflecting on the lack of public sector capability during the COVID uh, moment. Then lastly, this whole issue of kind of new institutions, you know, it's definitely about redesigning some existing institutions to be more outcomes oriented, including the budgeting process, you know, outcomes oriented budgeting, outcomes oriented procurement. But in many countries, we also need new institutions. I mentioned public banks. Public banks are about providing patient long term finance to those organizations that are willing. So not picking winners, but picking the willing, willing to move. Ideally, I'm saying so it should be. Uh, ideally to move towards these directions in a mission-oriented way. So the work we did in Scotland, for example, was to help set up a whole new public bank called the Scottish National Investment Bank. And the, the warning was, don't just make this a handout machine. Like in Italy, we have Casa Depositi e Prestiti, which often has been just a handout machine. So being a mission-oriented national investment bank means precisely really fostering those questions. Where are we trying to go? And then providing that finance across many different sectors not just picking a couple sectors that are key, but with those conditionalities to move in that direction. So thank you so much. Uh, I could go on, but I'll stop myself. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Mariana. That's a, a wonderful overview of, of, of missions in their entirety, I think. And you, 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 you kept exactly to time. Perfect. Um, right. So over to Clara now, who will, who will talk to uh, the EU missions program um, and, and her involvement in that. And so over, over to you, Clara. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you, Mariana, for, in, for, for your inspiration for so many years and for, for being together here today. Listen, I, I would like to take a step backwards because why are we doing missions? Because we have something to do. So in my, in, in, you know that we have the European Green Deal in the Union, which is a huge undertaking, a huge mission, if you allow me the expression. And we have to, to roll it out uh, with a number of things there. You know, it's not only about it's not only about climate, it's about energy, it's about industrial policy, it's about uh, the way we live. Uh, so it's it's an aspiration for a better quality of life, a better, uh, a, a better life for future generations uh, a, a, and a growth with that, with the, with the sense, with the direction, as, as we know, we like to write. So um, we have um, we have to make a transformation of our economy, of our way of doing things. And uh, so we have a number of enabling, uh, enabling tools uh, and um, I could qualify that, for example, the European climate law. You know, we have climate law with, with certain stones saying by 2050, we have to become climate neutral. And by the way, in by 2030, you have to reduce your emissions by 55%. So we have a, a clear direction where we have to go in, in, in that respect. But to, to get there and to have this transformation, we have to invest a lot in innovation in technological and non-technological innovation, a lot in disruptive innovation. And uh, we have also to make sure that we keep uh, in the union our competitive advantage in clean technologies. And we have also to make sure that we deploy in the union the solutions that we either we have already or that we have to uh, to, to co-create uh, uh, for, uh, for the future. So um, this challenge is beyond uh, in a single member state. And it's certainly beyond the, the research and innovation policy. It's, and that's the first, the first uh, uh, big value that we have in working with the missions concept is that, yes, we are starting the seed, if you want, is being put in the research and innovation policy, but we have, uh, it has a pivotal role, but we have to go uh, beyond, otherwise we will not get there where we have to, we have to be. Um, we have uh, four, we have five missions in total, but we have four out of the five which are underpinning precisely this 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 change that we need for the for the to, to support the the green deal. 
uh, we are addressing the soils, we are addressing the oceans, uh, um, so quality of, of, of soil, the oceans, uh, the climate adaptation, and the, which is the one I'm, I'm responsible for, and the cities. Okay, so we are addressing different different aspects and different um, constituencies, if I can say, that have to take the lead in this um, in this uh, in this transformation. Um, we follow the commission. How did we set up? Uh, Mariana was referring to the work she has been doing with Commissioner Moedas, and uh, so we started. Um, once the concept was well understood and 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 uh, and we, we created some ownership in the institution with it, we we started by by um, um, identifying the five uh, the five uh, realms. Um, of missions, and um, we said to the colleges later, so our European Parliament and the, the, the Council um, of Ministers, where you have member states which are represented, and um, they were designed, uh, the, the, the big areas were agreed, the, the way in which they would govern was, was agreed, um, including mission boards, so the way in which we were uh, enlarging our co-creation basis, if you want, and also uh, we had to set in place uh, a coordination mechanism within our institution. So then the, we have all these building blocks, then uh, the, the, the missions themselves were, uh, were defined um, with clear objectives in each of them. And they were first outlined by uh, leading experts in the fields. So we were working with leading experts in, uh, in climate adaptation and the, the board was chaired by former commissioner and, and um, Danish minister, Connie Hedegaard. So she was leading all the, the, the reflection between uh, uh, of how the mission should look like and what would be the real mission that we have to do. Then uh, we have also to, had to design a process to make it operational. So we did, uh, 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 and I, I, I like uh, I like very much uh, uh, Mariana's uh, mention of the practice-based theorizing. So we have to go ourselves then uh, a, a little bit further. Um, and these missions were endorsed by our political leaders, by the College of Commissioners, and there was a, a, an official loud who said, okay, we have agreed on these five realms, on these five specific missions. Let me remind you, one was in cancer, which is improving the life of more than three million people. Uh, the mission uh, on, on, um, on um, marine and fresh water was protecting 30% of the EU sea area. Um, in the climate neutrality, um, in the, in the yeah, climate mitigation for cities, the objective is to deliver harder climate neutral and smart cities by 2030. And the one where I'm, I'm, I am um, responsible for is supporting at least 150 uh, regions in their transformation towards uh, the, the, the climate resilience that they have to do. Um, we have, um, we have. Um, Goals which are ambitious, and uh, but but need to be they need to be achieved if we really mean uh, becoming not only climate neutral in 2050 but climate resilient by 2050. Because we should not forget that we have to work as well uh, to deal with the with the effects of climate change, even if we stopped emitting uh, uh, tomorrow. And the, the the mission is one important vector of delivering the whole adaptation strategy. So it is very well embedded. The research and innovation policy and the climate policy are very well embedded. We have an adaptation strategy and to, to address the, the specific issues that we have with the regions in Europe, with the territories, we have a mission uh, to, to, to develop that. Um, I don't know whether I have still a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, you have, think, about, you have about one minute left, Clara. One, okay. Um, listen, there are, we will we, we have the, the discussion uh, afterwards, but the, 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 some lessons that we have learned. So we have to go beyond the, the sector based policies. And uh, so there is the capacity to mobilize cross disciplinarity to and cross sectorality. We know that innovation happens very often in the border. The second lesson is that, that the multiple levels of, of governance can strengthen the structure of the, of the mission approach, but, but it is an important element of complexity, which we have to address. Huh? Complex systems is, is, is something which is very present in our, in our and, the, and the third thing is that we have uh, to, to crowdsource expertise and intelligence through 
all the life of the of the mission when we are where where we are um, uh, designing it but also when but then i say more importantly when when we are working towards uh, towards uh, this uh, the achievement of that of that mission so that things become concrete and we create ownership by the different policy makers and ownership by those that need to act for this mission to be accomplished thank you Great, thank you, Clara. Um, but what a fascinating insight into the process of trying to create consensus around these quite complex missions. Right? And I think we could, it'd be great to hear more about, about the nuts and bolts of that process a bit, a bit later, perhaps in discussion. And, you know, I think it speaks to Mariana's um, sort of opening question around these missions have to be, you mentioned crowdsourced expertise, they have to be kind of bottom up, they have to be, they have to convene lots of different stakeholders, they can't just be a top down kind of Apollo style program in the 21st century at least. Anyway, right, so let's move on to Alex. Alex, over to you. Thanks, Matthew, and uh, thanks everyone. It's a, it's a real privilege to be able to participate on this panel and good evening from Australia. Um, being in Australia, I wanted to start by taking a moment to recognise the Ngunnawal people. They're the traditional owners of lands where I'm speaking and to pay my respect to their elders past and present. So tonight I wanted to give a high level overview of the missions program at CSIRO. We call it CSIRO or CSIRO. Um, it sort of depends on where it sits in the sentence, um, but just as a guide. But to outline the unique role that CSIRO plays in our federated political system and why this actually helps us in the context of delivering our missions program. And I also want to give you a sense of some of the missions that we've just started to implement in the last couple of months. So for those of you who don't know, CSIRO is Australia's national science agency. It's one of the largest mission-directed research, development and delivery organisations in the world. Our purpose is to solve the greatest challenges through innovative science and technology, and we deliver more than four and a half billion Australian dollars in value each year to the Australian economy. So CSIRO employs five and a half thousand people in Australia. We engage globally with a strong network of global research partnerships to build industry links and share our world-class science. We play a role within the Australian innovation ecosystem unlike any other agency. We work with businesses to commercialise Australian science and we create new industries and applications that grow domestic and global markets. So we're publicly funded, but we derive a reasonable proportion of our revenue from collaboration with industry and the private sector. And this situates, situates us in a very unique position that makes us market facing, uh, not necessarily um, in the way to begin with that, um, that we've been talking about with missions, but I'll explain how we get to that in the journey. So CSIRO is part of, but separate from government ministries. So we operate to support the three layers of government within the Australian system. We influence policies, but we, we don't set policies, we're guided by them. Um, we provide scientific evidence analysis and innovation to support those policies. Now we have a unique mandate within the Australian system, namely to deliver benefit to Australian industry and society by tackling the scientific and technological challenges facing Australia. We've been guided by unique challenges since CSIRO was founded in 1916, when it was focused then on what you could actually call an environmental mission at the time, which was to rid our productive agricultural land of a biological invader, the prickly pear, which had covered 24 million hectares of the land across Australia, basically the size of the UK. Over the last 100 years, we've built a track record of responding to challenges just like this by delivering impact through our science. However, the nature of the challenges that we've faced has evolved significantly. To eradicate prickly pear, we just introduced one species of moth. The major challenges that we're facing now can't be treated with one single intervention. And so we're increasingly called on to develop solutions to challenges that are systemic, complex and urgent. And that's how we frame our challenges within the, um, the context of developing the missions program. And around five years ago, Cyril arrived at a framework that was covering six challenges that would guide our investments into R&D. These challenges are broad swim lanes and they cover research themes that will be familiar to all of you. However, these challenges have elements of complexity and urgency and require a systemic response. And the examples that I wanted to refer to here in the context of green missions relate to our environment and the question of how we use science to ensure the ongoing resilience of our ecosystems in the face of increasing climate strain. How do we create new value from them? In terms of food and security and quality, how do we use science and technology to achieve regional food security, grow our exports in a way that is sustainable? And then energy. So how do we use technology to navigate a transition to net zero emissions and avoid impacting on the economic prosperity and welfare of all Australians and our regional partners? And CSIRO undertakes countless activities that address individual aspects of these problems. And we're renowned for our brilliant ideas and our ability to take them into the marketplace. But we haven't approached these challenges in a, a coordinated way across the whole system of actors 
to try and facilitate systemic transformation using science and innovation. We haven't tackled these challenges with the same sense of urgency that we're now facing. And we haven't sought to direct our efforts in a way that achieves the necessary scale to have big impact, which is what we need to do now. So it was in this context that around 18 months ago, CSIRO announced its portfolio of potential missions to deliver real world solutions to these challenges. We selected a first cohort of missions to bring CSIRO expertise and capability to bear on problems where there's either potential to reshape the existing market or to create entirely new markets. And following what's become the core ingredients of a standard mission, each of these missions needs to have an ambitious but achievable, time bound and tangible objective. And within the CSIRO context, we've set ourselves a lifespan for a mission to operate around five to seven years in terms of the, the suite of interventions available for it. We think that's just long enough to be longer than an electoral or a fiscal cycle. So it has to be set high enough that it's not going to be subject to the changes of political uh, interests. Um, and, but not too long that working towards a practical impact is too far away. We've developed a portfolio that's based on the existing capability within the Australian ecosystem and recognising the industrial structure of the Australian economy. And a number of these missions seek to respond to the impacts of climate change. And I was just going to list a few of those out. So one of them, which we're, we're planning to launch officially in the coming months, uh, is our Towards Net Zero mission. And this mission uh, is intending to build regional approaches to achieving net zero emissions and providing the practical solutions to actually deliver on the rhetorical aspirations of governments, companies and communities to be net zero by a certain date. It's all well and good to have an ambition, but you have to have a, a pathway to, to deliver on that. Um, and it's taking a regional and sector-based approach, uh, bringing multiple sectors together uh, in new and interesting ways. And we're looking forward to a few big announcements in the next couple of months on that. We have a hydrogen industry mission which uh, has the objective of uh, driving the price of hydrogen down to $2 per kilo and creating a clean, affordable and cost competitive industry as a key plank of a low carbon energy economy. We have an ending plastic waste mission, which is based on reinventing our approach to managing plastic production, waste and reuse. And a future protein mission, which is aiming to create a new sustainable protein industry that addresses increasing domestic and international protein demands by adding to rather than competing with our $20 billion a year beef industry. And so this is about creating brand new markets in the Australian system. And finally, equipping our farms and rural communities with new science and technology to build resilience to the increasing frequency and severity of Australian droughts. So I just wanted to go very quickly in terms of how we're, we're planning to actually deliver on these. So we've made a deliberate decision about how we resource our missions, which I think might be a bit different from at least the way that the EU had conceptualised it at the start. Um, and we think that this is key to ensuring buy-in within the Australian system and the way that the context works here. So our, our innovation system is highly decentralised and we don't have centralised funds to support uh, the financing of missions. Uh, so what we've done is allocated seed funding to those individual missions um, to allow those individual mission teams to engage closely with the market, to get investment and interest for the value proposition underneath those challenges, while bringing together otherwise disparate science and technology from within CSIRO and elsewhere to respond to the mission objective and the market interest. So we're trying to crowd in some of the resources from within our own organisation as a national science agency and try and ensure that there's relevance within the market uh, and the potential to create new markets and new opportunities out there. One of the key areas, uh, areas our missions are working within are the various ministries across our three layers of government. They're the policy owners, they set the direction and they've, they've done the, the mediation of the various views within the community about what the, the immediate challenges are. Um, and so we rely on them at the moment for, for doing that harvesting of policy uh, issues and imperatives that we need to deal with. Once we've seed funded these missions, we're stage gating the development of each of them in the context of our overall portfolio of missions. And following validation with our key stakeholders, we're then able to determine whether there's a broad consensus and buy-in on the mission-like solution that we've got, and to see whether stakeholders are willing to invest capability and financial resources into the mission as part of bringing together a coalition of the willing. Without this co-investment, we don't think we're in a position to scale the missions in a way that will allow them to achieve impact. So that's a precondition for us to move to a, what we call our launch phase. And it's when we get to that point that we have a clear value proposition and co-investment pipeline that we then formally launch our missions. And we've launched four of those to date, our future protein one, our trusted agri-food exports, our drought resilience and our hydrogen industry missions. And I've mentioned a couple of other ones uh, to give you a sense of what we think are going to be the next in the pipeline to be launched. 
So following the official launch process, each mission then takes its own path to achieve impact. And I'm very happy to give more minutes. detail. Yep, I was going to finish up perfect timing. Um, very happy to give more detail about how those missions operate in practice at the moment. I uh, just wanted to wrap up by uh, concluding with my opening remarks by saying it's early days for the program. We're 18 months in. Each of our missions has a five to seven year journey ahead of them. And we're learning by doing uh, consistent with what Marianne has been saying. And so very happy to hear the discussions and reflections from colleagues as we continue. Thanks very much. Great, thank you, Alex. Um, what a fascinating insight into into, into CSIRO, which I, I hadn't really had much uh, previous background on. So it's great to get that overview. And um, interesting as well to see a slightly different approach taken to the EU, I guess. There's a kind of the convening powers are different. There's a lot of science and technology and R&D that, that seems to be the thing that backs the missions here. I think that raises some interesting questions for discussion. So let's start with a, a quite an open-ended question, I guess, uh, to all of you. And I think we can start with Mariana and go in the same order, if you like. Um, what are the big challenges? What are the big difficulties mm -hmm. and challenges in implementing this approach or these approaches? Because they are slightly different, right? Am I allowed to share my screen? I've just seen that uh, I can do it at least. <laughs> so let me just <clears throat> talk about one challenge. Um, let me see if you can see this, which is how to make sure, this is an example from the UK uh, work that we did in the industrial strategy. For me, the biggest challenge is not to confuse <clears throat> sectors with missions. So even a cancer mission seen as one that just has to do with the pharmaceutical industry is, is, is not really what we're talking about, right? So making sure that a cancer mission had just as much to do with preventative care. So how we live, what we eat, how we move, <clears throat> that starts to become a mission in this kind of intersectoral uh, way so that we don't fall into the um, kind of old way. So this is just an example of what we did with the UK government, which was to take the transport sector out of its comfort of sectorness, right? So actually starting with future of mobility as a challenge. And then to be honest, this mission, you know, it's, it just sounds a bit too much like, you know, a nationalist agenda, but still it got specific, just like a clean oceans one, you know, we need to get specific about getting 90% of the plastic out within a certain amount of time, changing what goes into the ocean, but also, you know, how we take stuff out. Um, this one was trying to be ambitious for the government on trying to get as many different sectors involved as possible. So even the word universally accessible travel, so I'll just read it, by 2040 to put the UK at the forefront of safe, sustainable, universally accessible travel, creating congestion and admission-free zero accident systems. Now, by being quite specific on words like universally accessible travel, that by definition means that some of those bottom-up projects that are needed as kind of homework problems along the way, just like getting to the moon required new technology that ended up in camera phones, insulation, baby formula software, all those kind of dynamic spillovers across the economy and across these sectors, they don't just happen if they're not kind of designed into the targets that we're going after. So in this case, 100% um, accessible public transport with equal access across all models is one of those projects on the bottom. We'll stop sharing because then we'll get distracted. So I think that's that's one of the things that I've found to be the biggest challenge when we start confusing the pro the projects or even the sectors with the mission itself. So one of the questions I'd have for Alex is, are we sure that the hydrogen one isn't just one of the many things that would have to happen, uh, you know, in order to get to a mission that actually wasn't so focused just on hydrogen? In the same way that I don't think electric vehicles, for example are a mission, they're just one of the things that will probably have to happen with the, a, a clean growth kind of mobility strategy. Would you like me to answer that now? Or? Yeah, please, oh, do. If, yeah. You, if, you, if you want to, Alex, unless oh, you want to uh, yeah. reflect upon it while Clara says something, up to you. No, but no, yeah, no, no, the, I mean, the technology driven aspect of, of Cyro's work is, I guess, slightly distinct from the, from, from that, that, that mission oriented yes. work. And I guess that's quite an interesting thing to, to, to sort of reflect upon. Absolutely. And I was precisely going to cover that, that we are in a point where some of the missions are very much tech driven missions uh, in their inception. And this goes to, I think, one of the challenges that we've got, um, which is around getting political buy in um, and visibility uh, of what the missions framework looks like to back it. And sometimes you have to see what success looks like very early. And the easiest way to do that is get quick wins through tech plays. Um, and so I, I would say that, yes, the hydrogen industry mission at the moment in its inception is driven 
by that that tech piece, but it is very quickly moving into the the questions around safety, regulatory issues, uh, things that sit outside just how you deploy technology at scale. Um, but then the other consideration that we've got, and another one of the challenges we have is how what is the size of a mission? What is the right size? Um, do you need mega missions or micro missions sitting in different parts of the decarbonisation challenge more broadly? Um, and that, that scope question we tackle all the time when we work with our mission teams is what do you uh, what can you put in a thing that takes five to seven years to achieve an objective? Um, so we are very conscious of it, but it's um, yeah, it, it's a great point. Clara, over, over to you. What are the big difficulties and challenges in implementing uh, this approach? The, the main challenge is how to get the, the relevant actors on board. How do I mobilize the regions for them to say, ah, that's a mission which concerns me and I'm glad to participate in that mission. That's, that's the most difficult thing. Um, um, because this, this requires mobilization of the regions in that case, uh, but also all the decision making which is around that. Because we have uh, an already existing policy setup. So we have a framework program, we have a policy, uh, research innovation policy, but we have besides, even if there are links, a regional policy, for example. So how do we make sure that in, in existing policy settings, we bring everyone together? And uh, going beyond the, beyond the repackaging of things. I don't say, okay, I change you the label and then you're apart. So how do we really um, show that this is a much better way of working, of addressing systemic problems like the one of adaptation, because the one of adaptation is you, you need to you need to have a, a very good risk assessment, but you have also to deal with your transport infrastructure, you have to deal with the with how you set up a, a city. So the second big challenge is how you bring in the the the, the civil society. Because they are in, in issues like adaptation and in many others, you need to have them on board. You can't just uh, uh, change the face of, uh, of wetlands or of a city just uh, in, a, in a top down approach. You need to have ownership by the political uh, decision makers, but also by the citizens. And then, so it's, it's, it's adding a degree of complexity. So it's a, a degree of, uh, of richness, certainly, but a degree of complexity. Of complexity that is not easy to handle with existing uh, with existing instruments. To, to, to explain this to well-established constituencies, Mariana was saying that it was a way of, of getting each of the sectors out of their comfort. And that is difficult. That is difficult, uh, whether it is a sector or whether it is a policy realm. Because missions are often you are not occupying an empty space. I mean, there are many things that happen in terms of original development. There are many things that happen in terms of adaptation. So how do I position uh, the objectives of the mission? How do I show that we have all together an interest in doing, in inverted commas, the things we are doing, but in a different way? And that's, that's the main challenge for me. If I may um, take an, a question from the audience at this point, because I think it speaks quite closely to what you were just um, beginning to describe there, Clara, around um, bringing citizens and, and, and local actors into play into this. So Matthias Weber has a, has a question around how these missions are defined at the EU, le EU level versus their kind of hyper-local implementation. So how do the missions being implemented on the ground actually work in practice? How, do they, how does it translate locally in a way that isn't top down? So that's that's quite a big question, I guess. But I just wondered if you could talk us through a little bit about that sort of relationship between the EU and the hyperlocal uh, through your work with cities on climate adaptation would be would be great. Absolutely, that's that's a, that's a lot of difficulty because um, so what we are doing in the in the cities mission, for example, what they have done is that they have proposed a sort of contract with the cities. So they have opened the possibilities. Would you like to engage the cities of a certain size and become climate neutral by uh, 2030. Um, how do you want to do it? Uh, do you, it's sort of contract. We're thinking in the, in the adaptation strategy where, as you say, there is, it, it is also because mitigation sometimes is, it can be very local, but it can be less local. I mean, when you develop a number of technologies, they are 
sometimes, but very often not linked to the to, to the to the to the local setting. But when you are addressing adaptation, you are addressing very different uh, effects on very different places. In one place is the droughts that become a problem. In others is the floods. Uh, in others is the heat waves. In others is the uh, if the fires. So we have uh, you you very right in putting that question the, 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 the audience in that way. How do we? Uh, adapt an all-encompassing objective of the union for very specific and this there is only way in my view of doing that is that either you bring in the actors which is the regional in that case the regional authorities the the, the regional the, the business which are acting also uh, uh, regionally and the citizens of those regions otherwise we can say yes we have to be climate uh, resilient by 20 by 2050 but this has to mean something to those that need to do something about it. Great, thank you. And Anna Murphy has a similar sort of question for Alex, I guess, um, in that it would be great to hear about the nuts and bolts of how you work with businesses. So in the same way that perhaps the EU works with citizens and cities and, and local authorities, how do you guys work with businesses and, and, and markets in local, in local contexts to um, drive forward and deploy and scale and diffuse these different technological innovations? It's a great question. And um, so within the, the organization, we have a, a business development cohort and they're, they're embedded within each of the missions uh, that work for us. And so they, they, they build on their expertise with the, the various members um, in, in particular communities to identify what their, their pressing needs are. Um, and so a lot of it at, at an early stage is that co-development piece to understand what is the most pressing need for the particular companies and the businesses. Um, in the particular the space of the mission that's being developed and then the role of our, our teams within uh, the organization so we have a mission leader who does quite a lot of heavy lifting uh, both within the organization and externally sometimes we refer to as the strategic business development manager um, they're trying to to bring together um, both the scientific community within the organization and elsewhere in the ecosystem to understand what what we can do to actually solve some of those problems within the missions framework um, so the, that's the sort of the most nuts and bolts starting position in terms of engaging with businesses and communities. Um, and then that funding then provides uh, seeding to allow us to, to have other conversations on other aspects of, of the missions that we're doing. Okay, thanks. I add something. Um, Go on, Marina, yeah, please. Is that okay? Yeah, just something that, because I'm starting to, uh, how do you say, purposefully bring this up in every... <laughs> discussion which is labor <laughs> you know uh mm. there's some categories that we shouldn't in a kind of postmodernist way abandon you know yes there's lots of different civil society organizations but the fact that we often put trade unions into a civil society organization just kind of lumps it together with everything else including fridays for the future which is by the way an incredibly important social movement and social movements in general we should remember have always allowed capitalism often to go in the right direction you know we wouldn't have weekends not a bad thing. We wouldn't have the eight hour work day. We'd still have children working in factories had trade unionists not fought for those rights and they didn't come down top down. You know, there was movements for that, but we should look also at BLM, Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement, Fridays for the Future today are, are part of that kind of steering of the capitalist system. And one question is, do we have the capacity, the capability, the empathy within our organizations to be listening and working in a non-tokenistic way with these movements, both if I think of the, you know, the young people like Greta, instead of just patting them on the head, oh, isn't it cute that a you know, 16 year old, now 18 year old cares about climate change, properly taking into consideration what's being said. But on the trade union side, we are at a moment in capitalist history uh, that the labor share of global income is at its lowest it's ever been. The profit share is very high. So two things on that. First of all, policy is not about increasing profits ever. It should never be. That's why most tax incentives don't work. It should be about galvanizing, catalyzing investment. So those profits are actually reinvested and not financialized. Over $4 trillion have been used by the Fortune 500 companies globally, of which many are in the energy landscape, just to buy back their own shares, to boost share prices, stock options, executive pay. So that financialization of investment is a huge thing we should be talking about. Um, and secondly, 
in terms of trade unions, you know, of course, there is this concept of the just transition, which is a very strong concept. People like Sharon Barrows from the international labor um, <clears throat> movement have, have really kind of brought it to the fore and it's extremely important. However, based on the discussion we just had, it's been a bit too much ex post. You know, someone else, people like us, you know, academics, policymakers, businesses in a small room decide on what the missions are. And then the trade unions react to it and say, hold on, <laughs> let's make sure workers aren't screwed in the process. So we need to be investing in people, their skills, resources, so they can actually transition. Definitely very important point. But where are those voices ex ante? Do we actually have a labor voice at the table that is designing some of these missions and broad, more broadly speaking, that kind of wider, uh, not just engagement through consultations, but literally whose voice is at the table. And I think that's where I've been really inspired by the city level work we've done. I was just in Barcelona, um, I'm pronouncing it like an Italian, so Barcelona on, on, on Friday, working with Ada Colau's team. She's the city mayor there. And actually looking at the huge challenges they have around engagement, also due to the different levels. I saw one of the questions was about that. You know, there's the city, there's the metropolitan region, there's the province, there's Catalonia, there's Spain. <laughs> um, and as you know, there's lots of issues of trust along the way at each you know, level there. There's also sub-nationalist politics. I mean, it's very complicated and we shouldn't, you know, think it's too complicated. But the question of how to make sure that these different voices, even at that regional um, level, are, are brought to the table is, is a huge one. But I do want to bring in this labor issue. I think it's a really missed opportunity in the 21st century to go back to remembering that labor has often fought for some of the best things we've all benefited from, including the weekend. So the exam question is, what's the equivalent of the weekend <laughs> that we could all be benefiting from today if we think about it in that sense? Thank you, Mariani. Yeah, I think I think you've hit the nail on the head there. That is the, the big fundamental issue, isn't it? That missions um, haven't so far perhaps um, grappled with in the way that the, the way that the potential you just described there. Um, and 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 I'd add, I'd add not just labour, you know, urban citizens too, right? The consumption of these things is really important. That's how climate adaptation will 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 will, will occur down the line, I suppose. And I wonder if Alex or Clara has anything to add to, to that on that point, because I, I think it's quite a, a, an important one. I would only just add that it's a point very well taken and something that we are going to be looking at on our journey. So going from, as I said, we've got a tech focused approach and then we'll be starting to become looking at more systemic and transformative and that will instantly require us to, to talk to more and more stakeholders um, as we're co-designing what the, what the interventions for the missions look like. Um, there's, I would say there's already a high transaction cost with developing missions. Um, so just managing the the, the transaction cost of scaling that up to another order of magnitude. Um, that's a real, a real challenge that we need to reckon with. If I may, that's, that's it's a very interesting point you raised, Mariana. And I, I must tell you that as mission manager, I have not dealt with it. So, I mean, we bet it. There, there is not just because we've forgotten, there are a couple of reasons. You know that there is the, the European level uh, um, social uh, dialogue, which has its own um, governance and its own realm, and voila, well, here there it is. Now, uh, we come to the issue that the adaptation, the solutions, because here we are at the end of the day to, to address solutions for adaptation problems, is very, very local, very place-based. And uh, the activities that we are undertaking, we are always pushing those that are active, uh, that want to be active in, in the mission to to bring in um, the, the the relevant stakeholders and it's 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 a good idea that we that we remind those that are co-creating their own adaptation plans the adaptation strategies we have one per member states but not all regions have an adaptation strategy for example and even less an adaptation plan when you are really going into the not leaving anyone behind and in in in, in investment uh, 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 pathways. Yes, you are right. It's a, we should not be forgetting those that brought us the weekends, for example. Absolutely. That's a very good point again. Brilliant. Thank you both. Um, we have uh, a question from the audience, from Pablo Nera, who asks, how do these missions translate to developing countries or what we might call the global south or where state capacities to command the private sector are just not as sophisticated perhaps or where you know so 
that's a big question, I guess, for for thinking about the way in which you know this this rolls out over time, especially as the global south. Obviously, it's the it's the most populated part of the world, and, and, and yeah. as it develops. If I may, on that one, I mean, we we know that we will say a climate change is a global problem uh, yeah. that we all know. We have seen in the last COP how much adaptation has been brought forward and how much there is there moves because, because we have to. I mean, this is a question of survival if we do. So uh, it is clear that uh, for in particular for less, uh, less advanced countries, or poorer countries, uh, to, to, to call them as they are, this is a huge issue. It's a huge issue of, 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 of survival and of, of future economic development because also investing in, in, in climate uh, and in, in particular in climate adaptation is investing in, in future. So this is fair. now we have thought of that. What do we do? The missions, our mission on climate adaptation, are we addressing outside the union or not? You know that our research program, you know that the, the union is in principle an open, an open space. Uh, the research programs are open to the whole world. And then we said, what do we do with missions? So with missions, precisely because we are testing new concepts, testing new ways of working, we said to ourselves, yeah, if, if regions outside the union uh, want to work with us, no problem with that. But for the time being, our target in, let us say, supporting the, the mission is to uh, make union regions resilient by the defense. Now, we all know that there are many of this of the, of the, the knowledge, the, the tools for risk assessment, and certainly the solutions that you deploy are um, you can you can translate that into other parts of the world. So this will be part, hopefully, this and what we de um, uh, develop in the union will be uh, will be useful for other parts of the world. And you know that we are the biggest contributor to climate adaptation in the world in the, for the for the fund. So what we learn in that mission can also be uh, uh, knowledge and depends uh, the, the use of those uh, huge funds. Great. From, no, from the Australian on. perspective, yeah, just in, in response to that question as well. So our missions have been asked to, to look at the international aspect of delivery and partnership. Um, obviously, Australia doesn't have access to all of the science and technology expertise in the world uh, at its doorstep. So we have to partner to ensure that we, we bring that on board. But also in terms of deployment um, and ensuring that the deployment has, has a, a global impact, we have to tailor to the local circumstances of particular um, ecosystems. Um, and it, it's too early for us to talk publicly about some of the agreements that we've got in train around plastic waste. Um, but there are definitely some partners within our region where we have a direct focus on, on working with, with countries that would benefit from, from our assistance um, and trying to tailor the solutions to their local contexts. Um, the other reflection I wanted to just make was around, um, this is where I think some of the mission innovation um, programs of, of missions really uh, dovetails with some of this. Um, it's the multilateral forums under the IEA that are trying to deliver clean hydrogen and so on, um, and they have a regional focus. And I think there's a real opportunity for us as, as developed countries to, to work together uh, to ensure that there's benefit uh, delivering to them as well through the missions framework. Can I add something, um, Matt, just on some of these issues? Um, first of all, I think it's really important that we talk about the local and also in terms of the engagement, it's sometimes easier to do locally. So also learning from local to more national and global on, on the how to do that. I, I mentioned before citizen assemblies, they don't just happen. We have to invest in those spaces. I worked once with an artist called Oliver Eliasson, um, who you know, people might know also because he's the one who did the big ice cube outside of uh, Paris for that famous cop. And we talked for one of his uh, exhibits, we had a bit of a chat that then went into the brochure of defining public space. And we talked about public space as a safe place to disagree, right? You know, think of all the online hate. <laughs> they don't feel very safe to many people. So the more we can also invest in kind of town halls, piazza kind of moments to have that disagreement, that contestation, but also the macro level, I think we should also go from the macro to the kind of micro, which is, I think one of the biggest challenges I'm seeing globally is on the narrative, like literally the economic narrative. I, I began by talking about the need to have a narrative about shaping markets, but it's also a narrative about collective value creation and what it then means to, you know, strengthen those different actors that are gonna be 
at those tables. You know, if we don't resource those actors, including our local administrations, but also, um, you know, other uh, types of actors, but also having metrics to define how these different actors are actually working together. I've written a lot about the difference between parasitic and symbiotic interactions between partners, but also in terms of the narrative, you know, this is about putting the challenges, these kind of moonshots, the missions at the center of economic growth. We can't think that economic growth happens here through the old way. And then we do these really cool missions there on the kind of interesting, funky things, whether it's about health, the digital divide or climate. And I think this is a challenge for Europe where these missions were born out of the Horizon Innovation Program, but the real stuff we all know doesn't happen in DG RTD or DG you know, Innovation, it happens in ECFIN. <laughs> That's where during moments of crises, we start having issues about you know, budgets need to be cut, austerity perhaps has to be reintroduced under a different name. Uh, and you can bet that it's gonna come back after these huge amounts of money has been released, also in the US, trillions. You can already start hearing, okay, but at some point we need to you know, tighten our belts again. That would be the most foolish thing to do ever because we know that the consequences of COVID were so much worse because the local health systems had actually been star starved of the resources they need. So having a continual, not just in crisis mode, relationship with how do we create money, which we always do when we go to war. There's never a war that anyone's gone to, whether it's World War II or Afghanistan, and said, oh, God, sorry, we can't go. There's no money. Money is created, whether it's at the European level or at the national level to do things like war. How about also thinking about that kind of outcomes-oriented budgeting, money creation, a more, you know, not lack of independence with the ECB, but greater alignment between some of these kind of big challenges that we have and that money creation that we know also happens with the European Central Bank. But really it's about putting missions at the center, well, at the center, not the periphery. So that means, as Clara said rightly in the beginning, at the center of the Green Deal, which currently is under the cabinet, of, uh, of von der Leyen. It's not an innovation little, you know, siloed thing. But that is what I've seen to be really problematic in many countries that they might do the missions, but it's not at the center of how the Ministry of Finance thinks. It's not at the center of how the Treasury thinks. It stays siloed in something like um, Cicero, which is incredibly important, but how much do you think, Alex, that you've actually really affected how the Treasury and the Finance Ministry understands these issues of co-creation, evaluation, um, you know, money creation, debt, debt to GDP, you know, all these things that then come back to haunt us. And lastly, a country like mine, Italy, our debt to GDP is very high, not because we've had high deficits. We've often had lower deficits than Germany. It's actually high because of the denominator. So productivity hasn't grown, GDP hasn't grown, often because of these kind of old style thinking of what the role of the state is. And so this is the irony. We obsess about the deficit and then debt to GDP goes up and then we start worrying, you know, on the back of that, oh, let's cut public expenditure. And we know debt to GDP is, of course, rising right now due to these external forces of COVID-19. But how can we make sure that this understanding that we've been talk that we've been talking about is at the center of how we actually understand the economy and not just a little pet project mission? Sorry, that was a bit of a rant. <laughs> No, it's great, Mariella. I don't know if Alex wants to wants to come back to that, but it has to be brief if you, if you do. No, okay. it's better for me not to comment at this point. Uh oh, I <laughs> no, assume no, no. that means you agree. <laughs> you can just nod. <laughs> well, that was a fantastic discussion. I feel like we only just got into it. Uh, we've got loads of questions from the audience we haven't managed to actually get to even. But um, thank you, thank you so much, all of the, to all the panelists for. Uh, for giving their time today and and, and and providing us with a real sort of uh, thought-provoking discussion and hopefully we can go away and think about this and 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 there's there's another couple of events this week so please check check those out um thanks so much thanks again bye thank you thank you, thank you. Oh, nice bye. to see you guys bye bye, bye. Thank